Here's a sneak peek from this episode. I have always loved the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, the one where Diane Lane visits on like a tour trip on a tour bus thing. And then she just like gets off in one of the stops and then doesn't get back on and she ends up buying a house and renovating a house and all this stuff. So I think I just always like had this, you know, vision and version of of going to Tuscany. I'm Scott. And I'm Melissa. And we are the Sunshine Travelers. Our passion is travel and sharing our experiences with those who enjoy it as much as we do, or those who want to learn more about travel, or even those that just want to live vicariously through our travel stories. No matter where you fall along that journey, get ready to hear about our firsthand experiences as we visit some of the most interesting and amazing places on Earth. Italy, A mesmerizing country nestled in southern Europe boasts a rich tapestry of history, culture, and natural beauty that has captivated the world for centuries. Italy is a land of diverse landscapes from the snow-capped peaks of the Alps in the north to the sun-drenched coasts of the Mediterranean in the south. Renowned for its exquisite cuisine, Italy tantalizes the taste buds with its pasta, pizza, and fine wines. Italy's warm hospitality and passionate people and timeless allure make it a must-visit destination for travelers seeking a blend of history, art, and natural splendor. So grab your passport, pack a bag, and let's journey across the Atlantic to Italy. So Scott, today I wanted to talk about seven places to see in Italy. And just based on our experiences, I wanted to tell what we would do differently And then where we want to go next. And so we have also talked, we have several people who have been to Italy, who are going to Italy that we want to have on as guests, but we have some people going who have requested an episode on Italy. So we just wanted to share a few things and a few tips. So ready to get into it? Yeah, let's start out with Milan. That was our, at least that was my first uh, venture to Italy. You had been before, but Milan was, was mine. Yeah, so that was an interesting, like a very last minute trip for us. I think we probably mentioned a briefly about it in the Ireland episode, how we got there. But so you have to go back and take a listen to that. But basically what we did was we had to go to, it was Lake Lugano. You had to go for work for a meeting. And because we were going over there pretty soon after that, you were just like, oh, let's see if we can make this work. Because two transatlantic journeys, like back to back, that's just hard. And then just the cost as well. So we ended up, so you just, we just taken that as, you know, as part of our trip and, and just making it work. So we ended up changing our flights around a little bit. We ended up flying into Zurich and then spent the day there. And then later that afternoon, took the train from Zurich down to Lake Lugano. And then a couple of days later on to Milan in order to connect to that trip. One of the things that we had decided we wanted to do in Milan is you can't go to Milan without seeing the Last Supper. Yes, that had something that was something that was on my bucket list. I'm going to talk about another trip in a, a minute where we had thought about trying to do this, go into Milan and, and seeing this, but it didn't work out. So I think since then it had been definitely on my bucket list. And so initially you tried to get tickets to go see the Last Supper and they weren't available. Yeah. So th- thankfully I was like, okay, if we're going to go, like we need to figure out how to make this work, but they weren't available. And so we had learned, oh, actually we hadn't, we hadn't done that other trip yet, but I guess I was just like figuring out how can we make this work? And I ended up booking it on Viator and seeing that you could do like a walking tour of the city and then you ended at the last supper and had the information from the tour guide and and stuff like that. And so a lot of the times places like this that tickets are reserved and things like that ahead of time, you know, so that these these tour companies can sell it. So we went ahead and I was like, can we please do this? Like we we've got to see this and do this while we were in Milan. So we booked that. Um and you want to talk a little bit about the tour? Yeah. Let me just first of all say, you know, it's it's weird that we do a podcast because like I have a maximum word count every day. And that might be something that we I don't know if we've talked about that before or whatever, but, you know, speaking, listening, whatever, there's like a max word count every day. And once I hit that, I'm done. I mean, I am physically exhausted when I hit hit that 
you know, that capacity every day. So we get on this walking tour and thank goodness it was like these little headphones that you put into your ears and you carried this device around. And so you could hear her as you were walking through the different sites. And oh my goodness, she described everything into the most you know, distinct little detail that you could imagine. And so before we got to the Last Supper, I was done. I had reached that max word count. I couldn't listen to any more. But thankfully, this was one of those tours where I could just take that headphone out of my ear and and just look at things and absorb stuff for a little bit without having to listen to it. And so if you don't know, when you book a tour in Italy, the tour guides have to be like certified, highly trained. Like it's not just, oh, they're sticking somebody out there to give you a tour. Like it is legit, like they have gone through so much training. And so and I think they just want you to, you know, get your get your money's worth. And so absolutely. And so a little bit about this tour met outside the Duomo. So we didn't get a chance to go in the Duomo. But we did did then start and walked us through the famous shopping arcade, the Gallery Vittoria Emmanuel II. Beautiful. You've probably seen pictures of it. The beautiful like domed glass shopping arcade. And then just all through the city. I think it was about three hours long. And then ending at where the Last Supper is. And she had told us a lot about it. And then we, you know, got went inside as a group. So it was a great, it was a great group tour. I would say it was probably like a 12 to 15 people. So not a huge tour. Just a great way to get an overview of Milan and then get to see that on our bu- bucket list. And so after that. Oh, Can I say something yeah. about the Last Supper real quick? Absolutely. I don't know what I was expecting when we went in there, right? And I understand the historical significance of it. And so being able to see that, but I think I was like imagining a pain, a painting on like canvas or something like that. I didn't realize that this was an alfresco on the wall. And so it's been through so much, you know, through wars and stuff like that. It has been through so much and, and I guess, you know, just, fading over time and stuff like that is actually not as I didn't get that all that I thought I was going to get seeing this is really neat though. And I do understand the historical significance of being able to see it, but I don't know that it just wowed me. Melissa is shaking her head. She doesn't know what to say over there. That's true. I, What's neat about it? I mean, it's one of those things like all those famous works, right? Like you've seen them. You've seen pictures of it. You've seen the Mona Lisa. You've seen it. But I I think there's just something about seeing it in person, you know, how they do protect it, how they are trying to restore it. The fact that it has survived for so long, you know, and like you mentioned, like through wars and that they would have to board it, you know, like board up the wall, to just try to protect these things is just, you know, to have something that that's older than, you know, our country, older than anything here in our country is just always amazing to me. So what we had actually done uh, for that part of the trip is we had actually, since we had taken the train down, we, we stored our bags in that Milan train station. They have places, we had done the same thing in Zurich, they have places where you can pay to have your bags there for that day. Our flight was actually out of the uh, Bergamo airport, which is another airport that you can fly in and out of Milan. So just be aware of that, that there's a couple of airports in Milan and knowing which is the right one. And so what we had decided to do, we decided to then stay the night in that little town of Bergamo. I had read some really great things about it and Then our flight was out early the next morning just to make that super convenient. So I wish I would have done differently. I mean, I know this was like, okay, we're adding this on. We're adding Milan on. We're adding this on. We can't do everything. So, but I wish that we would have had a little bit more time to explore Bergamo. Everything I had read is like, oh, if you're going to Milan, make make sure that you do that. But it was like, I think you had a meeting and then by the time on the phone and then by the time we got to there and had our dinner, 
we just didn't have a chance to explore the city. So I would say put that on your bucket list if you're in Milan and have a little bit of time. And you may even want to stay in that smaller town. A lot of times, you know, more fun to stay like in a smaller place. So I would say in Bergamo. But we did want to share a, just a really interesting experience. So we got there and got checked into the hotel. We needed to find something to eat. There was like an alfresco like pizza place right there. And so we went and I have no idea why. But we ordered. Well, we th- saw it on the menu and we were just like, what the heck is this? Yeah. So I guess it was really just more out of curiosity. I'm not sure what they called it. It was like pizza Americano or American Americano pizza. I don't something like that. So we ordered it and ended up being like pieces of hot, hot dog, dogs. like not even sausage and like French fries on top of this pizza. Like nobody eats that. And like ketchup. Oh, and ketchup. Like, so nobody eats that. We don't eat that. Oh, it was, it was just, I mean, it was edible, but we could have had something like more authentic. So I'm not really sure why we picked that. So if you go there, like don't just even out of curiosity, just, just don't. So like even here we would go eat you like the, do it. we would eat like a spicy diavola pizza or something like that. But I guess Scott's right. We, but I would say, um, is that probably if we had just ordered whatever, like we probably would not remember anything about that meal. And so then obviously we remember that pizza. All right. So number two is Cinque Terre. And so unfortunately, Scott has not been able to visit there. So it is definitely on our list to go back. So we need to go there again. I actually had the pleasure of going here back in 2006, I believe it was. This was my first time to go to Italy, first time to see the Mediterranean. And I was actually on a sports camp mission trip to a smaller town, I guess it was probably northwest of there called Torre Pellice near Turin or Torino. We were helping with outreach, like through kids sports camps and stuff like that. And on our day off, they wanted to take us somewhere to like, let us just experience more of Italy. And so they decided upon Cinque Terre. And I think now a lot of people have heard and seen pictures, of the beautiful, it's on, on the hillside. So basically, Cinque Terre is five towns, five small villages on this hillside overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. The buildings like look like they're like built into or just like on the side of the on the side of the mountain. And you've got the pinks and oranges and yellows, just absolutely picturesque. I mean, I know you've seen pictures of it. And and of course, you know, now that Instagram has gotten so popular and things like that, people just there's you know, so many Instagrammable spots and and things like that. So So, if you were on Instagram right now, you might see a reel that said, don't go to the Amalfi Coast, go to Cinque Terre. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So it's situated on the Mediterranean. It's actually a smaller sea called the Ligurian Sea. And so basically... We had gotten there by driving from Torre Pellice. We parked in one of the towns where it has a smaller train. So like if you're taking a train trip through Italy, then you're going to have to get on the smaller train to access these smaller towns. Uh, we walked between them. We swam in the ocean. We got lunch and snacks at some of the various vendor stands and then headed back. And so I will say this was also my first ex- experience with like the squatty toilets in the train station. Um uh, I was just surprised, I guess, to see that in Italy, but that was there. And then just seeing the Mediterranean. So Cinque Terre can also be accessed as a day trip from the port city of Laverna. So if you're on a cruise of the Mediterranean and it ports there, and if you've been to some of the other places like Pisa or Tuscany or Florence, that might be something that you could do for a day. But I definitely want to go back and probably in try to hit it in the off season and then just spend the night in one or more of the towns. If we packed light and packed a couple of backpacks or something, we might be able to, you know, go from one town to the other and just spend some time and just being able to like wander the streets and and stuff like that. I have a question for you. How much gelato did you consume on this trip? On that trip? A lot. I think this was her introduction to a love affair with gelato yeah we're gonna talk a little bit more about that trip here in a minute but absolutely that that was the first time yes i had had real authentic gelato so number three is tuscany so speaking of laverno 
this is actually what we cho- Scott and I chose to do when we were on our Mediterranean cruise is to spend the day from that port city of Liverno. As I mentioned, you could go to Cinque Terre, you could go to Pisa, you could go to Florence, which would be a stretch getting there and getting back and getting to see everything. And so we opted to spend the day in Tuscany. I think it was just a destination that you dream about seeing for yourself. I have always loved the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, the one where Diane Lane visits on like a tour trip on a tour bus thing and then she just like gets off in one of the stops and then doesn't get back on and she ends up buying a house and renovating a house and all this stuff so I think I just always like had this you know vision and version of of going to Tuscany so basically what we did was through Viator I found a day trip that went to was from Liverno and had a back on the ship guarantee so make sure that you know we would get back in time And this tour allowed us to do a wine tasting, to see a couple of towns, have lunch. Um, Our transportation was, there was, ended up just being one other couple. Funny enough, we'd actually already met them on the ship. We had had dinner with them on the ship. And then later on, we, they were the other couple on our tour. So it was just the four of us and the driver. So we got a lot of personal attention. It ended up being through a company called Driver in Rome. They have lots of great reviews and so if you're if you've never been to Tuscany and you're on a cruise, I highly recommend just an overview experience like that. We got to go to the working winery and we got to go through the towns Volterra and San Gia San Giamano, maybe? San Giamano sounds yeah. good enough to me. And so we and then he stopped somewhere and had lunch. And so we had lunch with him and he just gave us a ton of great information. He would we would stop in the towns. None of us were super big shoppers, so we didn't spend a lot of time shopping, but we would stop in the gelato shops and things like that. And he showed us some of the Roman ruins that were in those towns, like the big amphitheater type things that were in those towns. And So Tuscany is one of those places where, as we have the opportunity to do so in the future, this is where I'd love to go rent a villa for like a month long and just, you know, be there, be present in the the town you know really sink in this culture i mean this is one of those places where i think we would fit in perfectly it'd be one of those places where it's like would be an absolute true like relaxing vacation you know envision a place like that has a a pool you could go to the shops in the market and get your food maybe take a couple of cooking classes and and things like that absolutely another thing that we did on our cruise is we went to Rome. So our cruise started in Rome and then ended back in Rome. So we had a couple of days that we actually spent in Rome while we were there. And, you know, Rome is definitely one of those cities that is just chock full of history and then artifacts and things like that. So, you know, in Rome, Remember, you're going to need to allow your t- yourself time. If you really want to see and do all of these things, you're going to need time to do it. Now, we pushed through and we got so much done in Rome, but I would suggest that you give yourselves more time than what, what we had while we were there. And I think for me, like one of my most favorite and most memorable parts of going to Rome was walking on the Appian Way. And, you know, that to me was just something so special. And and so, you know, you need to do that. You need to allow yourself the time to just go up there, walk on this, and do like what we did. We just kind of allowed ourselves to get lost along the way. And, you know, make sure to take your phone so that you'll have Google Translate to help you get back when you find yourself accidentally stuck behind a gated community or something, but uh, just gorgeous place. And, you know, there's so much, so many more things that we did there in Rome as well. Yeah. So of course you have to see the Colosseum and the Roman Forum. And we definitely recommend that you book a tour, not just by tickets ahead of time, book a tour so that you will know, like if you're there, so you will know what it is that you're seeing and they can tell you about this. And again, can we just stop and say, if you're going to an arc, archaeological site or something like that. I don't care where you are in the world. If you're going to go see this, it's probably good to book a tour. Someone who knows the history, they know all the story, they know the time frame, they know all the different pieces and can put all that together for you 
or else you're just looking at a bunch of broken rocks and and stuff like that and then you know without that detail you're trying to stitch together in your head kind of like what it might have looked like but that tour guide can actually paint a picture for you yeah and just from past experience different places there's nothing more frustrating than like you've been to the place and then you're interested about something and so you do a little bit more research and then you read something where you're like oh, like I wish I would have Known that. known that before so that you could like pay attention to something specific. And so that's what she was able to do. We did the Coliseum tour that went in the underground. So you could see like where the animals were kept for these gladiator fights and, and all that stuff. And again, it was a lot of information, but I mean, it was just fantastic as well. And so then of course you have to go see the Vatican. So that um, was another one of my favorite parts of that that part of the tour or that part of the trip was going into the Vatican. Once again, we had a tour guide who took us through and, you know, explained everything to us. And, you know, and so going into the Sistine Chapel and seeing that, to me, that was more, I think, overwhelming than seeing the, the Last Supper. But, you know, hey, everybody's got something different that you'll experience while you're there. You know, I just loved being in that room and there was no, there's no furniture or anything like that. It's just this open hall and, you know, people are kind of seated around the side and looking around. They don't want you to take pictures. They don't want you to talk, you know, but just sitting there and soaking that up and, and looking up was absolutely amazing. I would definitely say do not book more than one tour in a day. Like it's just, it's too exhausting, too overwhelming. So use the other time to go see other sites like the Spanish Steps and the Trevi Fountain and things that you can just walk and see. And then like Scott mentioned, just wandering on the Appian Way or wandering through the piazzas and finding other fountains and finding coffee shops and things like that. Just giving yourself time to just explore the city on your own and just you know, relax as well. And we recently <laughs> learned, so if you're traveling and, you know, we're talking about walking through all these places and stuff like that, and maybe that's starting to just feel a little bit overwhelming that you can't do this, but you want to see all these things. We just recently learned that there is a golf cart tour of a lot of these famous places like the Trevi Fountain and stuff like that. This, the, the Spanish stairs and and all of those things that you can do in the evening. And so they take you on this golf cart and take you to all these different places. So that might be an option for some people who are listening and that might have thought that just sounds like too much. Yeah, because those places are tucked, you know, tucked away a little bit and you can't, you know, it's not like you can just get right out of a car or right off of, you know, taxi or the train or anything. So, yeah, I think that is a great option to be able to do that if you have, you know, mobility issues and it'd be a great time of the day to do it as well. Yeah. My dad and stepmom are going soon and they've booked this tour. So we'll have to ask them about it after they do it. Yeah. Maybe we can have them do a little snippet on that and, and kind of give their recommendations. But I would say besides seeing those major sites in Rome, I think what Scott mentioned walking on the Appian way. And of course we have this story about, you know, we wandered cause we're like looking at Google maps and we think it's a road that passes through and it ended being, you know, a gate. I think we talked a little, I think we told that story in our summer trip to Europe and pressing the button and using Google translate to say, help. We need to get out of here. I mean, we could have walked back, I guess, but it was a long way, but just having that memory. Also seeing th sites like the keyhole of the Knights of Malta, where you can look through that little keyhole and, you know, see, see the Vatican and the uh, chapel there. And, um, and then also just learning like how to take the train. Our hotel was not like right in the city center. So that might be a recommendation, like depending on, where you're going to, where most of your activities are in Rome, like being really conscious about where your hotel was. We ended up using points for this particular part of the stay. And so we were a little bit further out, but by the time we got the hang of it. And so what we actually did, like Scott mentioned, we, we were there and then we took the cruise and then we actually came back to that same hotel just to use points. And after we realized how far away it was, we were like, Oh, well, should we, ch you know, should we change the next few nights when we get back and try to find somewhere else? But we were like, no, now we've almost, we've got that learning curve. Like we know where that train 
train station is. We know how to take the train. We know how to get there. So we just decided to to do that. So some of those things, just helping you, like making you feel like a local, even though we were there for a short period of time, I imagine if you go and, you know, stay for a month. And, and, and that, that is kind of one stuff. of the benefits of staying in an area for a longer period of time is that you start to learn, you know, how to get around, how to use, you know, public transportation, stuff like that. I definitely wouldn't recommend that you rent a car in Rome. That would be a, a, a no on my list of things to do. And so just just because I can't imagine trying what parking must be like. And so, you know, use the transportation, use taxis, stuff like that. But I don't think I would rent a car. Yeah, it was very easy for us to use taxis. We went out to the way that we actually even found where the Appian Way, we actually went to some of the catacombs and taken a, well, joined a tour. It wasn't like anything we had planned in advance, joined a tour. But I remember us just grabbing a taxi and taking it out there. And then one night we were going to take the train back and they were doing construction or something like that. So it was very easy to do, use taxis to get around when we, when we couldn't use the train as well. All right, so number five, if you are in the area of Naples, Sorrento, Amalfi Coast, Capri, you definitely want to go see Pompeii. Just a, just a fantastically neat archaeological site. Scott did mention a tour, so we didn't actually take a tour of this, but you can definitely book tours and arrange tours and have tour guides meet you there in advance. We actually did just the, we had downloaded on our phones the Rick Steves walking, listening tour. He has a lot of those, so you can go check those out. And I, I will say that it was a little bit difficult to follow along and sometimes know if you're in the right place um, on that audio tour. And so, you know, I still would recommend you might want to look at, you know, hiring a tour guide for the day um, to take you there. Yeah, we actually saw a family. A family was on the train with us that were, were meeting their tour guide. I think that would be a great idea. But this particular tour, just the audio tour that we did, he did give us an overview. Like you would see like a type of a house and then a business and then a shop and then a brothel and then the baths. And so it kind of gave you an overview and you didn't have to see everything. It took you on the highlights. But I do think a tour would be a great way to do it. So what we had done was we actually had taken the train. So this was the same trip. We had taken the train from Rome down to Naples and we were staying in Naples again, with some points. So then we took the little commuter train down to Pompeii. And um, we, we'd said, I don't, I think we would probably skip Naples um, in the future, right? So, you know, other than going to Pompeii from Naples, I think we felt like Naples was just more of a, maybe a place where you would live. Yeah, or, you know, or work or something like that. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. Now, you could have taken, if we had decided to do like a, a day trip to Capri, like we could have taken the boat from there as well. Again, I think we would ended up using points. So if we had to do this again, we would definitely go on that train all the way down to Sorrento. And then from Sorrento, it would have been more convenient to then just go up to Pompeii for an afternoon. You could go to Capri from there and go to the Amalfi Coast um, as well. So, yeah, I would definitely say that would be our recommendation is to have, stay in Sorrento. I will say that we have heard that Sorrento is a little bit more expensive, though. So just be prepared as you're budgeting. Know what your costs are going to be in Sorrento and just prepare for that. But I think overall, it'll be a wash because, you know, you're not going to be taking the long train rides, you know, to and from and you're going to be more centrally located to other activities that you want to do. The other recommendation that we have about Pompeii, and I, we just got lucky, was to go in the afternoon. We had taken that train down. We had asked for recommendations for lunch, had lunch, and then took the train down to Pompeii. So by the time we get there, most of the people are like leaving. We still had plenty of time, but it was just not as hot and it was still plenty hot. Though. It was plenty hot, but it was just not nearly as hot as it would have been. But I just remember it just it wasn't crowded. And then as the sun started to set, you know, or started to go down, I just remember the light being beautiful on, you know, those ruins there. So that would be the other recommendation if you take a and if you plan it with a tour guide, say, hey, this is kind of what we've heard and they can help you you know, organize that, but that we just lucked upon that, but that we just thought after uh, we were really thankful that it wasn't so crowded. The other thing Make I sure remember, to take your water bottle too. 
Yes, for sure. And they had a place, I think, to refill the water bottle. I also remember, this is where we we tell people and we talk about the cup of coffee we had when we were in the train station in Naples waiting to go on that little train to Pompeii. I remember it being a very crowded station and we knew it was going to be 10 or 15 minutes and there was just like a little coffee stand there. And for one euro, I think, it was, um, you just go up and get your espresso and and in the train station and one of the best cups of espresso ever. So Amalfi Coast, Melissa mentioned the Amalfi Coast. If you've seen pictures of Italy, you've most likely seen pictures of the Amalfi Coast. And it's definitely one of those places that you should put on your bucket list. I think, you know, my perspective is one of the best ways to see the Amalfi Coast is probably from the water. And so we didn't do that. But, you know, thinking back, you're going to get some of the better views and stuff from the water looking back towards the coast rather than being on the hillside but you know definitely the experience of driving through the Amalfi Coast was something that is absolutely unforgettable we had hired a driver for the day to take us down the Amalfi Coast and you know that goes back to our recommendation we were staying in Naples we hired a driver we had to drive from Naples down to the Amalfi Coast so that was a good drive in and of itself, if we had stayed in Sorrento, we would have been right there. But, you know, the driver took us down through the Amalfi Coast. And in some of those little towns, you had really tight little turns that barely a car could fit in. But you would have two lanes of traffic. And then often you would have full-size tour buses that would be coming through there as well. And it was funny because the dry, our driver would have to get out and go and direct traffic and tell people, you've got to back up, you've got to move here, you've got to move there to allow these buses to make those turns. And then the whole time you were just holding your breath because you knew that one of these buses was about to wipe out the side of the vehicle or take off a mirror or do something because it was just that close. And I asked him... Well, how often does this happen? He's like, oh, all the time. And literally happened twice, like while we were on the road. And so, of course, we're thinking like, why don't they fix this? How can you fix this? You know, just like our way of thinking. But it's just like, oh, this is this is the way it is. And a lot of those. It seems to me that you just wouldn't have big buses. Well, and a lot of those buses, you mentioned tour buses, but a lot of them are the public buses. So that that was actually our other option is that we could have taken. You can take public buses from Naples or from Sorrento to get to those other destinations. So that would obviously be a much more affordable way to do it. I think you would need a little bit more time. And so we literally just had that one day. And this was the part where, because it was part of this longer trip, we didn't plan in advance. And so it was kind of last minute. Are we going to do this? Are we going to go to Capri? We had gotten the people at the hotel had found somebody to do this for us. And it worked out great, but that is another option. But yes, those are those, they're public buses. And so, but there again, it's like, oh, why do they have these buses? If it constantly multiple times a day, like stops the traffic and everybody's having to figure out how to back up and you're in all this traffic. But I would definitely say, um, definitely could have rented a car and driven. And if you were going to do a long road trip through Italy, that probably would be a great way to do it because we just had that one day. I wanted both of us to be able to experience and see it. So if we had rented a car and you had been driving, you would have really had to pay attention to what was going on and not really get to enjoy seeing everything. Well, so our friends Mike and Suzanne did this trip within the last year or so, and they actually rented a car and they said parking was a problem. Like trying to find a place to park the car was, you know, really difficult. So Maybe maybe driving there really is not a good option. Yeah, true. Um, then they had mentioned they were going to stop in Naples, I think, probably to stay at, eat at the same pizza place because the place we ate at was pretty famous. Couldn't find parking. And then I know that they mentioned even they spent the night in on one of the towns in the Amalfi Coast. And even it wasn't like, here's where you're staying. You're parking right there. Like they had to park somewhere far away as well so that that's definitely true maybe if you're adventurous you would rent a moped well and i was just about to say no Vespa. no do not do not rent a moped the locals do it you see lots of people doing it but the beauty we had several times that our driver pulled over you know 
great vantage points looking down over the coast and and looking back onto the city sometimes and you know obviously he does this trip a lot so he knew some of the people in the area and he would stop at certain rest stops or whatever and you know people would take good care of us give us something to drink and you could get some great photos but I, I still believe the best vantage point would be from the water looking back. Yeah. So if we had to do this again, like we mentioned, we would stay in Sorrento or we would spend even more time and stay in one of these other towns and then like do some kind of tour or a boat, something that would take you off that coast to be able to see that coast from the water. Absolutely. All right. So that was number six. So number seven is the town that I actually stayed in or the the region that I stayed in when I did that mission trip was Torre Police in Torino. And so this is in Northern Italy with the view of the Alps. So this was my first time in Italy. Like I mentioned, first time seeing the Alps, absolutely gorgeous. This was the home base for our mission trip. The couple that we were helping had their church. And so we really got an insider look at that because we, the women from the church would feed us like breakfast, lunch, and dinner when we weren't out doing the other activities. And we stayed in some of the housing that the church had. And so then they were taking us to their gelato shop. And and so here's really our tip for this one. So this might not be something that you could replicate exactly, or you wouldn't necessarily go to Torre Police, but find like a, if you have the opportunity, find like a smaller town and see if you can book like an Airbnb where maybe you are in a room in somebody's home or like a guest house in somebody's home, especially if they are going to be there and you can interact or if they provide some of the food. I would say that for Italy would probably be absolutely fantastic. And then they could recommend, hey, go to this gelato shop or go, uh, you know, go do this. You can talk to them and get to know them. This was really special for us. We got to play. The couple had two little girls and we got to play with them and they were just young and couple of things like based on the nationalities of the parents and people in the church and then also the region where that is like the little girls like spoke English and Spanish and German and Italian and it was just this bits and pieces right because they were tiny so it would be like a sentence like with all these different languages which was just really neat um, to get to have a different experience when you're traveling they showed us how to drink the that we could drink the water coming out of those drinking fountains that were just all through the town. And so that would be my recommendation is that would be a good way to have an experience that might be a little less expensive. And then you really get to know like a family, like a farm stay or something like that in, in a small town in Italy somewhere. And this really sounds like, you know, cause think of Italy, it's a peninsula. It sounds like that we, we covered a lot of territory in Italy but we really haven't like we've only covered like the upper third, I think. And I think we've covered the places where it's like most of the, like the big tourist destinations as well. But you're right. Like we've barely scratched the surface. Um, I mean, we, as well. we haven't even gotten down to the hill of the boot, much less the boot itself. Right. Yeah. And so, so, so what's on the list Scott, for Italy? Well, let me start with kind of the more Northern end of Italy. We definitely want to go to the Dolomites, or if you were there, maybe you would call it the Dolomites. But, uh, you know, we want to go to the Dolomites. Venice is something that's on our list, you know, as we start to head down further south. Florence, Sicily, and southern Italy. The Lakes District, Lake Garda, and Lake Como, and then also Capri. Uh, I've heard you've got to go to the island of Sardinia. Like, that's that's an absolute must-do and so we got to make sure that that gets onto the list. For me, I want to start with an extended stay in Tuscany. Yeah, and I want you to be able to go to Cinque Terre too. And I think that is something like from Tuscany, if you did that, like I, like I mentioned, you could visit some of those other places too and kind of combine that. But yeah, so we can Tuscany and just let that be a relaxing part of a trip. So Melissa, you know, with every destination trip we talk about, what should we pack? So you're going to Italy. What do they need to pack inside their suitcases? So definitely take your camera, whether that just be making sure you have the capacity to do that on your cell phone or whatever, or, you know, a professional camera or, you know, bigger camera. I remember the first time 
that I went and just came back with just so many beautiful photographs and having fun just using those and editing those. Throughout Italy, I would say good walking shoes for the cobblestone, just practical shoes, whether they be tennis shoes or sandals that are just good for walking. Make sure that you have clothes that cover your knees and your shoulders for going into churches. So lots of you know, towns are going to have some kind of church or Duomo or whatever that you want to go in and see. And so just make sure that you're prepared for that. And then other than that, it's just really just checking the weather for the for the season. And if you're going to, you know, a coastal town and want to dip into the Mediterranean Sea, just having a bathing suit to be able to do that as well. Yeah. And I think that our advice, as always, is pack light. And we love our e-bags backpacked for that reason. You know, you can throw a week's worth of stuff in those e-bags easily if you pack well and don't, you know, overpack heavy items and stuff like that because the streets are old, a lot of cobblestone, stuff like that. And if you've got the roller case, you're going to break a wheel on those things. You're going to be clickety clackety, whatever, all down the street. So I, I think having those backpacks is preferable way to travel around Italy. Yeah, because the trains are just a great way to use that, as we've mentioned, you know, like why cars wouldn't be beneficial. If you're going to Cinque Terre, even if you had a car, you're going to have to park it to then travel to some of those smaller towns and if you're going to spend the night there. So I think definitely having a way to pack light and and just have it on your back is going to be the best way to do it in Italy. Funny enough, you know, we've talked about these e-bags quite a bit. And uh, so my dad and stepmom are leaving with my brother and sister-in-law and they're going to Italy for a trip. And so they ordered these bags and and they've got them. And my dad's already loaded it down, put it on his back, make sure that everything was good so he could do a dry run. And they are really excited about using them because they can see what an advantage it's going to be over trying to pull a suitcase. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about their trip too, because they are going to actually, they've taken our advice and are going to go fly into Zurich and take that train down to Milan and start there as well. There are so many distinct areas to visit in Italy. It is almost impossible to do it justice in just one visit. I imagine that Italy is going to be staying on our countries to visit list for quite a while as we have so much more to explore. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll find some inspiration to help you with your travel journeys. Please consider going on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. The more five-star reviews we have, the more likely we are to be featured and discovered by others. Make sure to follow or subscribe to our podcast to be notified of new episodes as they are released. You can also find us on Instagram at Sunshine Travelers Podcast. Remember that's travelers with one L. Most importantly, share it with your friends and help them catch the travel bug. You never know, they may become your greatest travel companion.